Tom, what is tensegrity? Well, I'm really pleased to talk about tensegrity. This is the one of the most central concepts to the new biomechanics. Um, and I don't really see how you can understand uh, the way the body works without it. You know that all biomechanics is about tension and compression. That's all there is. That's the yin and the yang of biomechanics. That's the sum total. You're pushing or you're pulling. You're hanging from the ceiling or you're bracing on the floor. So there's a lamp above me that's hanging from the ceiling. There is a table beside me that's sitting on the floor. My feet are on the floor, my bracing onto the floor, and my shoulders are hanging off my ribcage. That's all you've got. Shear, bending, torsion, these are all combinations of tension and compressional forces. So the sum total of biomechanics is how do you handle tension and compression in the body? Now, we are used to what's known as continuous compression structures. Thus, this brick sits on top of this brick, sits on top of this brick, sits on top of this brick, sits on top of the bottom brick. Now, the bottom brick may, may must, should, has to be strong enough to handle the compressive forces of all the bricks that are above it. That's why New York is built on good main granite, because granite of all the rocks has the highest compressive force of any rock. So you put it in the foundations of things because it can take compression. Now we have cement, now we have steel reinforced cement that can take even more compression. But of the natural things, granite is the most compressive force. If you took two teams of horses and strapped a chain around one piece of granite and strapped the chain around the other piece, the other end of the piece of granite, and you took the two horses apart from each other, you could split that granite pretty easily. In other words, Granite's not good at dealing with tensional forces, but granite is incredible at dealing with compressive forces. Now, the way we build buildings are continuous compression buildings. This brick on top of this brick on top of this brick on top of a piece of granite. But the Empire State Building is all the way from the 100th floor to the ground is just one thing sitting on top of the other. And we conceived the body in the same way. So that when you see a skeleton in the classroom, it's like the head sits on the atlas, and the head and the atlas sit on the axis, and the head and the atlas and the axis sit on C3, and that all sits on the next one, on the next one, on the next one, all the way down to L5. L5 sits into the pelvis, the pelvis sits on the legs, the legs sit on the feet. This is our idea of a continuous compression structure and the skeleton that you've seen in your classroom since you were in fifth grade reinforces that idea that we're a stack of bricks or a stack of checkers and the muscles are individual units that like the cables on a crane move the stable skeleton around to uh, pick up something and put it over here it's a very robotic it's very industrialized view we've gotten a long way with this view don't please don't misunderstand me i'm not saying this view is wrong i'm saying this view is limited I am saying this view is wrong. It's not actually descriptive. We talk about levers in the body. The elbow is probably the closest you can get to a lever in the body, but the body is not built on leverage. It is not built on Newtonian mechanics. It's built on a different mechanics. Tensegrity is a way we can suggest our way into that new mechanics. Is this a proven model in the human body? No, but it makes a lot of sense. So let me see if I can play with this. We are not continuous compression structures like the Golden Gate Bridge or the Empire State Building. We are tension dependent structures. Our integrity depends on the balance of the soft tissues of the fascia and the muscle together. It is those balance of soft tissues that holds the skeleton up in the air, not the other way. The skeleton doesn't hold the muscles up in the air. The soft tissue holds the skeleton up in the air. And the skeleton isn't the skeleton. It is a series of bones floating in the soft tissue. And there is a form of engineering that much more closely parallels the body um, with some exceptions. So let's look at this for a minute. This is a tensegrity structure that is a portmanteau of tension and integrity. So the integrity of this structure lies in the balance of the cords, which I hope you can see on the camera, as opposed to the struts. Now the struts that are like the bones, similar to the bones in the body, they are compression 
structures. They are resisting compression from this end, resisting the compression. And these guys are providing the tension from one end to the other. But none of these compression members, none of the bones, none of the struts touch each other. This thing is held in shape, and I can even shake it, and it holds its shape. I can even knock it, and it holds its shape. Not because it's one brick sitting on top of another brick, but because the cords are held in balance by these tension members. Now, that does mean that they float a bit, which means that if, I hope you can see this, that the struts are moving a bit as I change the tension on the structure. But something really interesting is happening. It's getting stronger and more stable. Now I can't move the struts so much because as I force it together, these tension lines get tauter, the whole structure gets stronger and more like a solid structure. So right now it's fairly loose. I can wiggle this around a lot. But when I put strain on the structure, it tightens up and it won't wiggle around so much. You can see this in your body. If I just, you can do this yourself, take your finger, maybe put your hand against your body, wiggle this bone around. This joint, this metacarpophalangeal joint, the MCP, has a lot of play in it, okay? That's a bit like the loose tensegrity structure. Now let's tighten it. I'm going to take it into hyperextension. Take your own finger into hyperextension. Now try wiggling it. Whoa, you've lost all that wiggleness, right? There's no wiggle room in that joint anymore. Take it into hyperflexion. Take it into flexion. Now try wiggling that bone. Once again, there's no wiggle in that joint. Go back to the middle and feel how much wiggle there is in the joint. That wiggle we call adaptability. When the tensegrity is really tense, like here, or like here, you lose the adaptability because the structure has come in and become quite strong. It also means, however, that you get most of your injuries at the extreme end of motion, not in the middle of the motion where you have that joint adaptability, but at the extreme end of the motion. So if you jump over a stream and you land on the other side and the dirt on the other side and your foot lands straight, you're going to adapt really easily. But if you land on a stick, say on your little toe, it's going to turn your foot this way and bam, you're going to end up with an ankle sprain. Because you, know? you took that strain and suddenly put it in one spot. The design of the body is to take the strain as a system. And we don't think that way. We think Achilles tendon. We think plantar fascia. We think nuchal ligament. We think iliolumbar ligament or whatever structure. But in these kinds of structures, it's the adaptability of the whole that determines the integrity of the whole. If I were to take one of these strings out, it may go somewhere else. Let me show this with another model where I have more elastic strings. So again, we're seeing a six strut icosahedron here. None of the struts touch each other. They're all really loose because these are elastic strings. None of them are touching each other. They're all held in balance by these rubber bands. Now you may notice that what we started with, the Empire State Building, is a continuous compression structure. The compression is continuous from the top all the way down to the ground. In these structures, the compression is isolated, but the tension is continuous. Yeah? So my idea, of course it would be my idea, wouldn't it, is that the anatomy trains, that the myofascial meridians, are these continuous lines of strain that go from end of bone to end of bone to end of bone to end of bone around the body, and thus provide the continuous pulling in on the skeleton, and the bones are pushing out. So the compression is in the bones, the tension is in the soft tissue, the pull is in the soft tissue, the push is in the bones, and between the two you get a balance. Now, if you, this, this, these tensegrity structures have really interesting properties. For one thing, if I take and I make a shortness here, so you can imagine this is an injury, this is a short muscle, this is a postural problem. If I make it over here, do you see 
that the whole structure deforms. It's not local. It becomes distributed. So if the body is like one of these things, the body is a strain distribution machine, not a strain localizing machine. Injury comes when you localize strain. Strength, we're not talking about the strength of the individual muscle, we're talking about the strength of the body as a system, comes from the body able, being able to give a little, compromise a little, adjust a little, to move a little bit into whatever action is being done. You can do this for yourself right now. If you just um, take your arm behind yourself, something like this, feel now what's happening to your feet. Are you not coming on to the inside of your left foot and the outside of your right foot? Are you not pronating on your left and supinating on your right? If you're not, your whole body isn't responding to the motion that you just had. So we say the rhomboids, maybe you're using the rhomboids for this, the rhomboids are a supinator <laughs> of the foot. Um, just joking that way, but it's this idea that if you make a change here, you're going to make a change over the whole system and that adaptability, that ability to make those small adaptations is really important. There's another thing about this. Look at the two parallel, well they're not quite parallel, but look at those two parallel struts. If I pull these apart, the other ones are going to come together, right? Like a toothpaste tube. If I squeeze it around its waist, the toothpaste will come out the top. But watch what happens to the two parallels. Uh-oh, I'm pulling these apart and the other ones are going apart too. Can you see that those two parallel ones are going apart? And it's not just those two parallel ones. These two parallel ones are going apart either, the ones that are parallel to you in the image. Tensegrities are the only structures that if I expand them in one direction, they expand in all directions. And that's what I see in people. When I start to get them to expand in one direction, they expand in all direction, which means expansion in the joints, expansion in the functional ability of the muscles to move. It is generally we want that kind of expansive feeling in a tensegrity. Now, is the other way wrong? No. If you're in a defensive position, if you're really in danger, if things are really getting bad, if you're about to impact on the ground and you can't roll, you're going to hit, then tightening up is a good idea. It's not that one's bad and one's good. It's just that we spend in our society a lot of time with these kinds of restrictions on the motion and that when you start taking these restrictions off one by one by one by one by one, the body expands out into its natural adaptability, its natural responsiveness, its natural give at the joints. Okay? So, obviously this is an idealized structure. Your body is far more complicated than that. I've made in other places the comparison between the body and a sailboat or if you want to look at the work of Fry Otto. But this work of Kenneth Snelson, Buckminster Fuller, and more recently Graham Scar, all of these kind of Tom, the models of Tom Flemons, all of these things are advancing this idea of the tensegrity into the body. I think it really behooves us as people who work with the soft tissue, whether you're working training, you're not training the skeleton so much, right? You're training the muscles and the fascia. And those who work with the body in doing manual therapy, from chiropractors on down to massage therapists and physiotherapists, that to understand the body in this way, to understand the body as a strain distribution machine, to understand that the body communicates from one place to places quite far distant, I think that's a worthwhile thing to know. I have one of these models on my shelf in my practice so that I can show my clients how, what we're trying to do. Because they come in with a hip problem and you're working on their feet and you say, why are you working on my feet? I have a hip problem. Well, your feet and your hip are related through this kind of thing. And very, very often what's going to show up is the problem in the place that's overused and the problem is in the place that's underused. People don't know what place is over, uh, underused. They know about the place that's overused. <laughs> they don't know about the place that's underused. It's your job as a therapist, as a teacher, as an educator. It's your job to find the places that are underused 
and get them to open those up and start using them, and then the places that are overused will calm down. If you just keep going to the places that are overused and working them, you'll get a temporary relief because you will hydrate the dry points in here. The trigger points are dehydration, other forms of pain are, are forms of dehydration. So you work it, you work it with your hands, you work it with the, their workout, they get hydrated there, they feel temporarily better. It'll take them two or three days to start feeling so bad again. And they'll come in and they said, you did a really great job, I felt so wonderful, but now I feel terrible again. Well, I'm sorry, but you didn't do a really great job. You did a temporary superficial job of taking away the outer part of their pattern. Unless you can come in and find, where is it? You have to be able to see where the tensegrity is drawn in because where the result is, is so often, in fact, more often than not, not where the problem is. The problem is the place that moves too little, the place that's held too short. And getting that tensegrity into a nice balanced place is really important. And that's especially important in gait. So this is a model of, uh, kind of a model of a pelvis. You can see the sacrum here in the middle, you can see the femurs here on the outside, and these other six sticks in here are models of the pelvis. So maybe ASIS and PSIS and pubic bone and ischial tuberosity. But this isn't really an anatomical model, it's a model of forces going through. So we're going to imagine that this thing starts to walk. I'll turn it at an angle so you can see it a little bit better. As the femur moves, can you see the sacrum rocking back and forth? Can you see the pelvis moving? We think of the pelvis as a solid ring that never moves, but in point of fact, if you're going to have normal walking, you're going to be going through this kind of pattern with the pelvis. The pelvis is part of the, well, the hip bone anyway, is part of the leg. The sacrum is part of the spine. Together they make up the pelvis, but the pelvis is not a solid thing that never moves. <laughs> well, for us New England males, Pelvis is a solid thing that never moves. We know that if we moved our pelvis, something terrible would happen. But for other people in the world, south of the border, <laughs> not quite so uh, sexually challenged, the pelvis does move in African dance and the samba and the rest. And in a normal gait pattern, I use this model for my clients to have them see a normal gait pattern. In a normal gait pattern, the pelvis moves along with the leg. It's only if you're stuck at your sacroiliac joint that the leg, not even sure if I can do this, that the leg could move separately from the pelvis. I can even hardly move the leg on this model. What you're looking for is adaptability. What you're looking for is responsiveness. That responsiveness, tiny movements in the middle, make the big movements on the surface possible. The trouble that happens with some big movements in, on the surface in training is that the interior movements aren't happening. The movements at the joints between the ribs and the sternum, the movement of the rib joints in the back, the movements of the ribs relative to each other, even the movement in the bones of the head, little places that get stuck in the middle end up with great big consequences out on the surface. So. I would say to trainers uh, who unfortunately in their education are often more focused on the lats and the pecs and the big muscles on the surface of the body and wanting to make them strong and functional, that if you really learn to look for the small movements inside, closer to the spine, closer to the bones, like these motions of the hip bones, that the bigger motions will get easier and easier to train.